Nine. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the joint study session of the Lakewood City Council and the Lakewood Reinvestment Authority, September 14th, 2020. I'd ask the clerk to please call roll. Paul? Here. Abel? Present. Vincent? Here. Gutwein? Vita? Here. Skilling? Here. Frankstein? Here. Franks? Here. Johnson? I'm here. Zabir? Here. Harrison? Here. You have a quorum. Great. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody and certainly welcome to my colleagues and to the city staff who are joining us this evening for what is really the end of the budget process, but the beginning of the public side of this uh, opportunity for the community to start to weigh in and for council to start to dig in. This will be followed by two uh, public hearings. And tonight for your public input participation, that phone number is 1-646-558-8663. With the webinar ID of 973-1804-0178. And you will press pound to join the meeting. And then when you would like to speak, you'll press star nine and star six to unmute. So without further ado, we'll get right into item three, which is a presentation. And I will turn it over to our CFO, Ms. Holly Bjorklund, to get us going. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I've had one cup of tea and hopefully my voice is gonna be great the whole night. <laughs> We'll see how it goes. Um, so I am going to share my presentation for the budget. Okay, thumbs up that everybody can see it. Okay. So the, the city of Lakewood is experiencing unprecedented times due to the pandemic. As you know, this affects the budget and the budget process. The city is adapting to the current circumstances, continuing the important work of serving and the residents of Lakewood and safeguarding a sustainable financial future. This budget presentation is a financial reflection of the community's priorities and a collaborative effort of city council, staff, and community members to develop a plan that continues to provide quality programs and services for the community. So I'm gonna first start with the budget calendar. As you know, we had a budget not at board meeting on August 13th, and today we have the council study session. We'll then have on October 12th, the first public hearing, and then the second one on October 26th. So the overview of what we're gonna be talking about is the city budgeting. So just the overall um, process. And then the proposed um, 2020 revised and 2021 budget. We're gonna look at the total city budget and then the general fund and Tabor fund, and then uh, the Lakewood Reinvestment Authority, and then next steps and answer questions. So starting off with city budgeting. So, um, here are some Lakewood facts that may be of interest to you and to your constituents if you have decided to share this presentation with them. This can give your constituents a grounding point for who and what the city of Lakewood supports. 
One item to note is the population. So you can see the population growth over here. See my mouse. Um, and the population growth is starting to uh, level out. Um, so you can see uh, that this is one of the indications that Lakewood is moving from a growth city to an established city. Moving into the budgeting process, as I mentioned, this process was done with the input of city council staff and the community members to develop a plan that continues to provide quality programs and services for the community while addressing significant financial constraints. We appreciate the input that all of you have given to us. It's very valuable. I wanted to give an additional thanks um, to the directors of the departments. There was an extraordinary team effort put in by the directors, many more hours dedicated to the budget process to ensure that we have a budget that is sustainable and is focused on the community priorities. I also wanted to thank Ryan Diamond for his valuable work on administrating the process and countless hours of putting, putting together the budget book. As you've seen, it's quite large. Um, and last but not least, I would like to thank Kathy for her unwavering leadership in the process. As you can see on this slide, the directors first started with the community priorities, and then we analyzed the different parts of the budgeting, starting with estimating our revenues, and then we moved into our priorities um, for expenses, looking at programs and personnel, capital projects and construction, this is where we identified the reductions that we had to make the $17 million reduction from the general fund. Then we moved into evaluating fund balances and then the budget is um, budgeted by fund. Ms. Bjorklund, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just technically, could we please have uh, Councillor Gutwine moved from an attendee to a panelist and let the record note that she is in attendance? Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Bjorklund. So next we're moving into the proposed 2020 revised and the 2021 budget. And we're first gonna talk about total city. Um, so Lakewood um, has 17 different funds and they are grouped into five different types. The largest fund is the general fund, which can be used for any purpose. Then we have capital project funds, which is specifically for acquisitions or constructions and maintenance of capital facilities or other assets. The two capital project funds we have are capital improvement and, um, pres and preservation plan, and then the equipment replacement fund. For enterprise funds, um, it is a government owned business that has no more than 10% state or local government funding. Lakewood has the golf course, sewer, stormwater, and water utility. Those are the four funds for enterprise. For special revenue funds, they are restricted funds um, allocated to discrete purposes. So Lakewood has uh, the Grant Fund, Tabor, Open Space, Conservation Trust, Heritage, Culture and Arts, and Economic Development. Then the last category is um, internal service funds, and it's used to account for the cost that are shared or allocated across multiple departments and funds such as medical, dental, and other insurance related costs. And there are four funds within internal service funds. <clears throat> so again, this is citywide. Um, we're looking at the revenue by fund. So citywide, this donut shows the distribution of revenue by fund that is forecasted for 2021. As you can see, the general fund is the largest um, followed by special revenues. So here's 
special revenues, um, capital projects, uh, and enterprise funds, and internal service funds. The city is experiencing similar challenges in revenue for the capital fund as the general fund. As the city's infrastructure ages, each year a larger percentage of the revenue in the fund must be used for annual maintenance rather than new capital projects. Since there are not a corresponding growth in ongoing revenue, this compressed investment is compresses investment in new capital projects. <clears throat> This slide displays how all city funds are spent by department. So again, this is total city. Um, what is included in all other, so this orange category, is a mayor, council, city manager's office, city clerk, city attorney, finance, HR, municipal courts, and planning. Each individual department is um, uh, in all other is less than 3% of the total um, spending that we have for the city. So that's why they were grouped together. And then we also have the non-departmental, which is this 12% that's gray, and that citywide employee benefits, debt obligations, special projects, and self-insurance funding. You can also see that each color within the department, so if we look at public works, that there's a shaded area and there's a non-shaded area. So the shaded area is non-personnel and the uh, not shaded area is personnel. So one item to note on this donut is although public works is larger in spending, so they have 29% of the total city um, spending, then the police, 80% um, <clears throat> of public works expenses are non-personnel, so expenses like asphalt. You can also see that the community resources has 47%, um, that's also non-personnel, which are expenses like facilities such as rec centers. The police has primarily personnel and they have 83% of personnel. This graph shows you the 2019 actual, so this first column. So we're again looking at revenue by fund for the total city. So this graph shows you the 19 actuals the 2020 adopted budget, the 2020 revised budget, and the 2021 proposed budget. The general fund, which is the blue bars here, you can see the decline in revenue from 2019 of 129.8 million for 19, down to 111.8 million in the 2020 revised budget. And that's that reduction that I talked about that um, we had to make for the general fund. Um, and then it improves a little bit in 2021 for the proposed budget of 118.5. The capital and um, enterprise, so the capital is that um, maroon color, enterprise is the green, um, has stayed approximately the same for each of the years. And the special revenue fund, you can see an uptick in 2020. So this is that gold, that gold color that's in the 2020 revised. Um, and then also it's larger in 2021 as well than from the expected run rate for 19 and the adopted budget. The revised budget for 2020 included funds of $12.3 million for the CARES Act. These federal dollars are being used for response and recovery. With these funds, the city has distributed grants totaling close to $4 million 
to Lakewood small businesses and nonprofits that were adversely affected by the pandemic. Lakewood has also used these funds to ensure the safety of city workers and residents using the visiting city, visiting city facilities. Remote work has been a necessity during the pandemic and accommodations have been made to ensure that Lakewood continues to function effectively. There are also grant dollars that were moved from 2019 to 2020 revised. They just weren't spent, so it was moved over to the 2020 um, budget. The increase in 2021 from the run rate uh, for special revenue is due to Tabor transfer revenue and a large grant for public works. So next we'll talk about the proposed 2020 revised and 2021 budget for the general fund. Can everyone still hear me? You're cutting in and out. Your connection um, is cutting in and out. Okay, do you want me? Um, I was gonna say I could take off my video, but that means you wouldn't see my presentation. No, we need the presentation. You're back, so okay. we'll just keep trying to go. Okay. Um, yeah, I got a notification that my internet was unstable. So I'll try to keep going. So first let's discuss our budget realities for the general fund. The general fund has a challenge of a $17 million funding gap from the 2020 budget. As schools and recreation centers closed, so did businesses of all types from the pandemic. The closure had a profound and extraordinary economic impact on businesses and in turn on the city of Lakewood. There has been a significant decline in sales and use tax revenue, which currently represents over 49% of the city's total funding. These revenues are critical for the funding of many city services, such as police, road maintenance, city facilities, and support services. The general fund also has an ongoing challenge of limited revenue growth due, due to TABOR. Additionally, as an established city, the staff are evaluating and adjusting the financial approach for the city. Lakewood has several revenue challenges as we've talked about before in previous um, discussions. Beyond the financial impact of the pandemic, the city is experiencing or expecting, not experiencing, but expecting longer term challenges with sustaining revenue. Lakewood is experiencing a flattening and potential decline of current revenue sources um, resulting from a number of factors, including uh, customers shifting to online shopping customers purchasing more untaxed services than tax goods, Lakewood becoming an established city, the city's relatively low sales tax, um, sorry, and the city's relatively low sales tax rate. Lakewood is evaluating the current revenue sources and potential changes for the future to sustain the city's financial health while continuing to provide core services to the residents. A challenge for an established city such as Lakewood is that demands and the needs for services continue to grow, but there is not a corresponding growth in revenue from businesses or new residents because we're not growing as a city. This slide shows the distribution of the general fund revenue by type of revenue for the 2021 budget. Most of these groupings are clear as to what they include. The one that does not, um, is not clear is the intergovernmental that includes state and federal funding and other, um, let's see, and other also includes um, just 
minor things that uh, we haven't um, that we haven't got into the other categories. As I just mentioned, the 2021 budget anticipates lower sales and use tax revenue due to the pandemic. This, uh, as well as the increase in the property tax, has changed the proportions of where the general fund receives revenue. Sales and use tax for revenue for 2021 um, ex is expected at 62%, so this one, 62% of all general fund revenue. Property and charges for services, 10%, franchise fees and intergovernmental revenue, 5%, and all other 8%. This is a projected decrease of 8% in sales tax and use tax compared to the 2019 actuals. The property tax, a 12% increase compared to the 2019 actuals. So as a percentage, uh, the property tax has actually gone up of the whole. So in 2019 actuals, property tax was 8%, and now it's 10, and sales and use tax was 63%, and now it's 62%. So the makeup of our revenue is changing. So this slide shows you the economic planning and budgeting and the Colorado Legislative Council. And just a, a warning that um, these are all guesses. We don't really know what's going to happen, <laughs> but this is the best guess. Um, so also a reminder that their fiscal year is from July to June. So the forecast for July 2020 to June 2021 is negative 5.7% uh, for the Office of uh, State Planning. And for a reference point, last year they were forecasting a growth of 4.9%. However, they are off of the 2020 2021 decline. For Colorado Legislative Council, they re reflect less of a swing for both years. So 2020, 2020 and 2021 uh, was forecasted last year at 5.4% and now it's 0.3% and the expected rebound is 2.4% for 21 to 20, 2022. <laughs> so this next slide just displays the sales tax distribution as you've seen it previously tells you who gets what portion of the sales tax. In this one, you've seen this slide multiple times before. Um, and the item to note on this slide is the update for July, so which shows a 4% decline compared to 2019. The year-to-date on trending for sales tax is 10% down compared to 2019, which is an improvement from uh, the last time I shared with you, which was 11% decline. After the delay of a remittance, and that was the if uh, taxpayers are paying um, out of period, out of what the time period is, um, it still shows a 7% down and $3.1 million. So this slide gives you an example of property tax for a home valued at 350,000. As you can see, the city gets the smallest portion of this revenue. Property tax revenue is the second largest source of income for the city and are expected to be 11.8 million in 21 and an increase of 6.8% over the 2020 adopted budget. So going back to that slide of the proportions of how much property tax and other revenues we have, this is showing how property tax has grown. Um, 
So reassessment of property tax is undertaken by Jefferson County assessors in the odd number of years and property tax are collected in arrears. As a result, the city's 2021 budget reflects a commensurate increase in revenue. Lakewood and the Denver Metro region continue to experience strong job growth, resulting in higher demand for housing and an increase in the value of properties. However, we don't know if that will continue with the impact of the pandemic. So this graph, uh, so the general fund revenues. So this graph is showing you the 2019 actuals. Let's see if I can, okay, so this first column is the 2019 actuals. And then the second one is the 2020 adopted budget. And then the third column is the 2020 revised budget. And then the remaining columns are the forecast for 2021 through 2025. And this um, is just for general fund and it's net of the Tabor limit. So what we would be transferring over to the Tabor fund. The blue is showing you the revenue and the gold, these ones are showing you the use of the fund balance. The 2020 revised revenue expect, is expected to decline 10% from the 2020 adopted budget. So from, from the adopted budget here to here, so the 124.7 one, um, to the 110.1 um, is a 10% decline. And an increase of 1% from the 2020 revised to the 2021 um, forecast. As you can see from the development um, of the reduction plan, there is not an excessive use of fund balance to offset the $17 million gap that needs to be addressed. There is expected to be a larger use of fund balance in 2020 um, of 8.2 million, so here, and then a decrease of 4.6 million in the 2021 budget. The approach that was taken um, was to make a sustainable reductions versus depleting the general fund balance. With this plan, you can see that the expectations is Lakewood will stop using fund balance for operations at the end of 2021. We are expecting revenue to recover and exceed the 2019 actuals. However, you can see there's a flattening of revenue in 2024 and 2025, which um, I had mentioned earlier that um, we're expecting that we will see either a flattening or downturn with our current revenue sources. Is forecast that Lakewood can start reinvesting in the city in 2023. However, it's not going to be sustainable with our current revenues or revenue streams. So uh, we'll next talk about the expense reduction approach. In the short term, the city of Lakewood is well positioned to navigate through the pandemic due to a, a historical conservative approach to budgeting, healthy reserve fund balance, balances, and the CARES Act funding. Additionally, the hiring freeze enacted in 2019 has positioned the city finances to be resilient and better prepared to address these difficult times. Lakewood is committed to sustaining core services to residents while maintaining physical discipline which requires the city to address reven the revenue expense gap of 17 million from the 2020 budget, which is affecting every department in the city. The department directors had four areas of focus for the expense reductions approach, which are reductions that are sustainable, evaluation of resources across all city functions, team rec, uh, reorganization to realize operating efficiencies and reductions intended to minimize 
um, impacts to the citizens. This slide shows the general fund expenses for 2019 actuals, so that first column, 2020 adopted budget, 2020 revised, and 2021 um, proposed, which is the blue bars that are here. The other colored sections, these, um, show you where the reductions were made to fill the gap between revenue and expense. This includes facility closures, expense reductions, vacant positions and attrition, and general fund transfer. So this slide shows you the detail of the general fund reductions. You previously saw the preliminary column and now we have the final column to show the differences from year to year. But in total, it reflects the 17 million. So we're still making a reduction of 17 million, but um, the when we actually got all the details, the fallout of where it came from um, changed a little bit in category by category. Through this process, there were four positions that were eliminated and there were 47 positions vacant when we started the reduction process. And we are expecting 17 more through attrition in 2020. There will be a police academy in 2021 so that the police will not fall below strength. It will be assessed in April 2021 based on the actual attrition to determine the class size of that academy. Through the end of July, there were 60 open positions citywide. And the savings do, um, the savings that we have in each of these categories you can see the vacant positions is still at 3.7, staff attrition 1.6, savings due to facility closures is 1.5, non-personnel reductions um, to the net 2019 spending level, $3 million, reductions of travel, training, supplies, and other costs, $2.3 million, and then reduction of fund transfers out of the general fund $700,000 and that totals a $12.8 million reduction in 2020. And then for 2021, we have a staff attrition of 24 positions. This is just standard attrition that we expect to happen, which will be um, $2.3 million. Personnel savings due to um, the Facility closures, 200,000. Reduction of overtime expenses, 400,000. Deferred maintenance and reallocation of resources, 800,000. Revenue increase in specific areas, so that's 500,000. So it's not all um, cost reductions. We do have a small amount of revenue increases that are just in specific areas. And so that total for 2021, is 4.2 million and the total reduction for both years is 17 million. Although every effort has been made to maintain funding for core city services, it is anticipated that the reductions will have at least some impact on the service level. As I mentioned, um, there will be one police academy. Uh, there's typically two per year, but uh, the chief has um, said that he believes that we'll still be able to stay within strength if we just have one. Service uh, response times may be slower in, the, in areas such as planning, public works, and parks. Deferring maintenance may impact systems performance and efficiency of employees. And then foregoing salaries increases um, inc creates risk of losing high performing employees. This donut shows you that we basically in the general fund only have personnel, service and supplies. 
There is a small amount of capital outlay and debt services, um, but primarily it's those two categories. <clears throat> So as I was showing in the total CD spending, this shows how much is spent in each department and the split of personnel versus non-personnel after the reductions. As you can see, the largest area of spending for the general fund is the police department. As I mentioned before, all um, departments, all other departments is the mayor, council, city manager's office, city clerk, city attorney, finance, HR, municipal court, and planning. And then non-department includes citywide employee benefits, dental, and medical. So you can see on here the distribution of um, personnel versus non-personnel in the general fund funding. It still reflects um, that the police has the largest portion of personnel the community resources, more, um, a larger portion of their funding um, or how the general fund spends their money uh, is on people. And then public works is still about 50-50. For the general fund balance usage, this show is showing again, the 2019 actuals the 2020 budget, the 2020 revised, the 2021 forecast um, through 2025. The blue bars are uh, the fund balance. So these are the fund balance. The red are the use of the funds balance. And you can see here this one that's in a circle it's because it's a circle is that the 2020 revised is replacing this one. So this won't be used anymore. So we won't be using the 6.6, .6, but we're recommending that we use 8.2 million. This is a larger portion of using the fund balance for 2020. However, since we're making a reduction of $17 million, it's not a significant increase. Um, so we are also showing that we are adding to the fund balance uh, in 2022, 2023, 24, and 25. You can also see that the addition to the fund balance is starting to decline again in 2025. And this is um, because of the current revenue sources um, we don't expect that they will continue to increase, they will start to decline. So the next section I'm gonna talk about is TABOR. So this is otherwise known as the Taxpayers, Taxpayers Bill of Rights. TABOR is a Colorado constitutional amendment that limits government revenue increases to inflation plus a small growth factor. So here's the calculation. We have the consumer price um, index, which includes common um, customer spending items such as fuel, clothing, food, housing costs, et cetera. And then we have local growth. So any new construction that occurs in Lakewood. And those two percentages is the allowable growth. So for example, let's say CPI is at 2%, local growth is at 1%, then the allowable growth would be 3%. So um, there are two calculations for a TABOR revenue limit. And whichever one is greater is the amount that needs to be returned in case transfers um, uh, in our case, it's going to be transferring to the Tabor Fund. So here's an example of what can happen with the calculation. Please keep in mind that Tabor limits um, specific revenue, so it does not include all revenue. So in this first um, graph, 
you'll see all revenue, which is Tabor limited. So we have more revenue that comes into the city than uh, uh, almost 120 million. Um, but this is the piece that's only limited by Tabor. As you can see, historically, it has been the total revenue limit that has been uh, what has been greater. So here we can see that um, we would have to, if we didn't have our, our temporary debrucing, we would have to return these funds back to the taxpayer. And on the property tax side, which is the, the second graph that you have here, um, to date, we haven't been hitting the property tax limit. So it's really been the um, Tabor overall revenue limit that we've been hitting. However, with the decline in total revenue, we are expecting that Lakewood will not hit the total revenue limit for 2020. So you can see that here, this is what we're forecasting. But it will hit the property tax limit in 2020. You can't totally see it because it's the same scale, but it is slightly above. So even though there is expected to be a decline in revenue for the general fund operations, Lakewood will still need to transfer funds over the Tabor Fund. The second impact this will have is the ratcheting down effect, which we talked about the last time we looked at Tabor. And you can see that in this line here where Tabor is saying you can spend up to this point, but because of this lower spending um, that we're expecting for 2020, Remember, this is all forecast, so we're not sure that's exactly what's going to happen. But um, if that is to happen, then the amount that we can collect will start to decline. And the reason that this is showing it's going back up is we're making an assumption that it'll come back at 3% per year as to what our allowable growth will be. If revenue flattens out, um, whether it's the pandemic or otherwise, uh, not our specific revenue, but in general for the community, the CPI flattens out, then we wouldn't be able to um, get back to that higher level as quickly as we're forecasting. So this schedule that I was showing you here was for total revenue. This one is showing you Based on those assumptions, this is what we think the impact would be to the general fund. And I've showed you this schedule previously as to what we were anticipating the impact is. So you can see here for 2019, the general fund piece of what was transferred to the Tabor Fund was $7.4 million. This 1.8 million estimate is um, based on what we think the property tax amount will be over in the Tabor limit and what would be transferred over to the Tabor fund. And that's based on that we are expecting the property tax to be higher, as I mentioned earlier. Then this $5.5 million would be um, hitting the all um, hitting the all revenue limit. So as I showed you here, for 2021, it's above that line. That's this 5.5 million plus any that goes to any other fund. And uh, again, we're assuming that we would be able to grow at approximately 3% for every year after that. And that's why it would come down to 3.5 transfer for 2022 and 2.5 million for 2023. Um, but if the growth, um, it flattens out, it would stay higher like the 5.5 million. So that's that effect of the ratcheting down um, that we've talked about previously. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about Tabor funded projects. In 2018, voters elected to allow the city to keep revenue collected in excess of the Tabor limit through 2025. 
By voting to temporarily lift the limit, taxpayers enabled the city to direct Tabor refund dollars to three prior priority areas. So a separate fund has been identified to detail how the Tabor dollars are spent. And these monies represent only significant new investments um, the city will have in 2021. So you see here we have the new park acquisition, which was separate from the three, one third, one third, one third. Um, the third, first third is the park acquisition, park improvements, and park maintenance. And then a third for police assets or personnel and then a third for transportation, sidewalks, and outdoor lighting. So the projects that are listed underneath that are some of the larger projects that are um, being funded by the Tabor Fund. And um, uh, we'll be discussing um, more about those projects in, later in the presentation. This slide shows you what was historically funded and what was transferred to the Tabor Fund. So the blue is what was historically refunded. And then the orange is uh, what was transferred the Tabor Fund. So before I move on to the departments to talk about um, what uh, their particular areas. Um, there were some submitted questions before um, this presentation, and I'll be answering some of those questions. Um, and uh, the other department directors who are presenting will also be answering some of those questions. Because we got several questions um, pretty close to this presentation, we're not going to be able to answer all of them, but we will try to answer as many as we can. And we do appreciate your interest in the budget and asking questions. So um, the first question that we had was about um, council chambers and modification due to the pandemic. And the question was, what are we modifying? So council chambers were to be modified to ensure the safety of council, staff, and citizens using CARES Act funding. However, the modification required um, could not be completed by the end of 2020 as mandated by the CARES Act. So um, remote meetings were determined to be the most appropriate solution. So exactly what we're doing right now. Um, the next question we got was from page 87 of the budget book and the total financial obligation, um, uh, that section, the total financial obligation, um, but they were questioning why does that go down in 2021? So it was a higher level, it went down and then it went back up. Um, so the answer to that is in 2000, the 2006 BCOP ended in, or is going to end, in uh, 2020, which is $2.3 million. So that's why you have the decline from 2020 to 2021. And then also in 2022, we have an increase because of the final payment of the 2006 ACOP has a larger payment of $5.3 million. So the next question, um, what franchise fees does the city have and are, there, um, credited, are they credited to the general fund and which companies do we charge the fees to? <clears throat> so the answer is the city of Lakewood has two franchise um, charges, cable television and gas and electric. Both of these fees are in place to allow entities to use city owned right away to deliver their products. Franchise agreements are currently in place for $2.5 million for Comcast and $4.5 million for itself. The next question was on page 24 of the budget book. 
The budget document um, contemplates drawing down the reserve fund in 2022 also, but the level of the reserve after 2022 is not included. Do we have that number? Yes, it's $20.3 million projected fund balance at the end of 2022. And one thing I forgot to mention during our presentation is that our fund balance for the general fund will be maintained at 10% or higher for every year that we're forecasting. So the next question is page 181 of the budget book, city attorney's office. I am assuming these figures do not include legal fees for outside counsel, such as defense counsel for self-insured, property and casualty and workers' compensation, et cetera. Is there identified elsewhere in the budget the amount projected for outside and special legal, legal counsel? Is it an item in each department's budget or is it included in the overall city attorney's budget? So the answer is most budgets for legal costs are included in the internal service fund of workers comp and property and casualty. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not most, modest budget for legal costs are included in the internal service fund of workers comp and property and casualty. And that totals 60,000 per year. Public Works also has a budget for water rights. Otherwise, um, all legal costs are consolidated within the city attorney's office. What is the expense amount projected for, sorry, next question. What is the expense amount projected for all outside legal counsel for 2021 and revised budget for 2020? So for 2020 revised is 372,000 and for 2021 it's 412,000, 100,000. Um, so I think that's all the questions that I uh, will be answering tonight. We do have other ones um, that we will have to do a follow-up on and each of the um, the presenters will be answering some of the questions that have been submitted. And then we have some department directors that are not presenting that are on that can also answer some additional questions that have been submitted and any new ones that we have tonight. So now um, a few of the departments will be sharing what they will be working on in 2021. The police department is up first and Chief McCaskey will be presenting on the police department. Thank you, Ms. Bjorklund, nice job. Good evening, Chief. Good, uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, so I have a few slides to cover and a few questions to answer. So Holly, if you could switch to the next slide for me, please. So this, this is just an overview of some of the things that we're gonna be covering tonight. Uh, just what we're, we're going to be using our TABOR funds for. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about technology. Uh, I'm gonna talk about property and evidence and uh, patrol equipment, and also some, I'm gonna discuss our body-worn cameras that we'll be uh, purchasing as well. So Holly, can you go to the next slide for me, please? So the first thing I wanna talk about is computer uh, technology and software updates. Um, uh, we believe that we'll use approximately $660,000 for our records management system for data conversion. We're also gonna be uh, converting our current property evidence um, data system to our new records management system. We also have a digital information management system which handles all of our photographs and recordings and things like that. And we're replacing that system that's end of life. We're also replacing our uh, 
training software. It's uh, what we track all of our police training with. It's required by the peace officer standards and training board. And they are, they are uh, going to a new system called benchmark. So we're upgrading that system, going to that system as well. And then we're also purchasing mobile data computers and police radios for new recruits and replacing radios as they become outdated. So again, that's approximately 660,000 that we'll be using that, that those TABOR funds for. So Holly, can you go to the next slide? So we're also looking at approximately $77,000 to purchase some new freezers in our property evidence warehouse. These store different things such as uh, blood blood kits, sex assault kits, things like that, um, DNA evidence. And so the, these current freezers are reaching end of life and they're really an important function that we need to maintain. Uh, we're also looking at uh, evidence lockers to hold more guns securely and uh, looking at supplies such as evidence bags, shelving, and some other things just to manage our property evidence intake. And again, that's approximately $77,000. So next slide, please, Holly. We're also uh, looking at about approximately $172,000 to continue our taser replacements. These tasers uh, generally need to be replaced um, every five years. That's, that's their lifespan. And then we're also looking at some security upgrades for our parking garage. This garage was built in 1984. And, uh, and we've had some incidents in the past where uh, cars have been damaged and most of our police cars are in there, employees park in there. And through the years, we've added some security fixtures, but it's always been a lack of funding that we haven't been able to do everything. So we're hoping to finish that off this year. Um, and also we have a 24 seven operation and we have a lot of civilian employees coming in at different hours of the day. So it's to, just to, uh, with safety in mind that we're looking at doing that. Um, next slide, please, Holly. So we're looking at approximately $91,000 to add some additional uh, security cameras in high crime areas. And then our um, property or our uh, crime lab, crime scene processing la uh, vehicle was replaced or is gonna be replaced because it's also at the end of its life. And so we're looking at um, upgrades to that. We need to add uh, additional heating and cooling capabilities, lighting, interior for the interior and the exterior and it needs to be a very robust vehicle because it's out on crime scenes for a long time so the we get the vehicle from the factory but none of the upgrades that we need are included in that so that's what we're going to be doing with that with that vehicle so next slide holly um so so we have uh we will be purchasing body cameras it's now uh, uh, uh mandated by the state of colorado um, but we have looked at body cameras in 2015, and we also looked at them in 2019, trying to purchase them. But we've never had the funding to really do it and sustain it because, it, as you can see, it's a very expensive program. And uh, so now Senate Bill 217 requires these cameras uh, for all local law enforcement by July of 2023. So our plans are to begin implementation here uh, or start the process immediately, and we hope to uh, be live with uh, cameras by the end of 2021 or the start of 2022, hopefully. Um, a lot of this depends on the availability of the of a selected vendor to provide these cameras because there's a high demand for them now, especially in Colorado, because it's, it's mandated. Um, but I, I can tell you our agents are fully in support of this, and they've wanted these cameras for a long time. Again, we just haven't been able to fund them. Um, but the, the ongoing costs are significant. We anticipate that to, to manage our program, we're going to have a supervisor and six staff members. And I know you, that seems a little large, but when you look at, you know, we need to manage equipment. Um, you know, you, they have to have somebody take care of this, you know, and that's a, that's a big proposition. We also need to uh, keep up with records released to the public and discovery to the district attorney's office. Plus, we also need to review these uh, the footage for uh, uh, investigating crimes. And we also are going to be reviewing this footage to make sure we're uh, holding our police agents accountable. And um, so there's, there's a, a lot of, a lot of uh, footage that goes with these, these cameras. Also, we need support from our IT department. And, and there's some infrastructure issues with our internet that we're going to need to upgrade as well so that we can download all of this uh, information to the cloud. 
And so we're anticipating ongoing cost of uh, equipment, employees, and, and digital storage to be 1.5 to 2.5 million per year. Um, so it's a pretty significant expense, but it's a good tool. And, and uh, we're moving forward with that. So before I introduce Jay, I know there were a couple questions that I wanted to respond to. So Tabor expenditures on page 393 that were 57,800. And um, there was a question whether that was for police department wellness and was that for fitness equipment? Um, that was not for fitness equipment. These were the uh, physical fitness assessments that we were doing with uh, the Sigma that they were the you know, basically very intense physicals for police agents therapists to make sure that we were keeping our police agents healthy. So there was no actual equipment purchase for those. And so hey chief, you're you're cutting in and out. Um maybe if you turn the camera off that might help with the audio. Maybe we lost the chief. Uh, Mayor, he's Mayor. at the very con he's at the very end of his presentation. Are you back, Chief? Yes. Okay. Yeah. He he just has a few more questions to answer. Right. Let's see if we can get through these. Okay. okay. Um, so, so, Chief, I, we lost you after the fifty-seven thousand dollar line item for for uh, agent wellness. Oh, okay. Um, so, did you, Mayor? Did you hear that that was not? Uh, equipment it was for the physical fitness assessments yes sir okay okay that's right where the next part is just a question about staffing in the police department and we have 62 agents listed in the support services um we actually have 62 employees in support services but there's only three police sworn police employees in that division so um our police agents are spread through patrol and investigations and that division only has three sworn so um and then um, there was a question regarding our police academy and would 12 recruits be enough next year? Well, part, part of the reason we're looking at 12 is because we had such high high numbers of classes or recruits in 2019, so we're over strength right now. So we're anticipating that 12 will be will work out, um, but we're gonna monitor that. And if we need to hire more, we will. Uh, it's just, we're gonna evaluate that in, April. So I believe those are all the questions I, I, I had. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Director of Public Works, Jay Hutchinson. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, City Council. I'll run through a, a number of projects that Public Works is involved in. We won't cover all the projects. We'll focus primarily on projects that are going to begin construction uh, later this year or into 2021. It won't be every project, but it'll be some, I think, that may be some good highlights. Uh, next slide, please. And one more, please, Holly. I'll start with some roadway projects. Uh, these are projects that uh, have already been approved by the city council in a previous budget, as are most of the ones that I'll talk about tonight. The picture on the left is an aerial view of the intersection of Florida Avenue and Union Boulevard. Union Boulevard is going up and down on the slide north and south. Florida goes only to the east at that location. This is a location that's met the warrants for a traffic signal for some time, and, and we've been able to find the, the funding to, to build that signal. The utility work's already begun. Uh, the traffic signal ought to be constructed as we go into 2021. The middle picture is an area where there is significant interest in pedestrian crossings. It's on Union Boulevard. If you go north of Alameda Avenue, past Cedar, up to what's called Siri Lane, which is next to the Wendy's. It's actually a private uh, drive, but it's called Siri Lane. That's where the pedestrian crossing would be. It'd be much much like the Hawk signal that's farther north uh, near the uh, uh, light rail station. 
The third picture is of the of, Han, of Kipling actually on the north side of Hamden. That long line of cars or folks waiting to make a left turn to go east on Hamden. And uh, that project is also planned to, to start shortly. The first two of these three projects are Tabor funded projects. The third one has a significant grant over uh, about three quarters of the expense for that project is grant funded. Next slide, please. Associated with roadways, of course, are walks and paths, which are part of the transportation network also. And there are a number of those projects as listed here. Uh, the bottom left picture is the location uh, for that first one on Wadsworth Boulevard on the east side, south of Mansfield. It's about to go to construction. In the uh, 13th and Lamar project, this is on the south side of 13 going, 13th going west from Lamar. I believe it's three properties to connect to an existing, existing path. Uh, the bids actually were open for construction here. Um, uh, actually, I think they open tomorrow. So those will be under construction in the next month or two. There's a path from the W line Garrison Street Station east to Estes Street. Today, people who are, are traveling east and west on that corridor on foot or on bicycle or other means other than a motor vehicle have to cross 13th Avenue a couple of times. This will eliminate the need for that crossing and, and get them straight into the station. Uh, this does require a waiver from RTD that we've been working on, So, but I, I still think this one will be under construction later and this year or next, probably next year. The first avenue project on the south side is a, a, a safe routes to school project. That grant covers about 70% of the project. And uh, that'll be a nice addition in that area where there's buses, there's pedestrians. It's, it's the main entrance to the parking lots for Creighton on the east side of the school. The next one I highlighted is new, and I need to explain what that word means. It's newly shown in the budget. Uh, it's not a new project. This is one we received a grant for I think in last November, and I passed that information along to the city council by email, but this will be the first year it'll actually show up in the, the budget and about 70% of that is a, uh, a grant also. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna shift out of what were capital improvement fund projects and Tabor fund projects and go to the enterprise funds. And these can be thought of as kind of a separate business entity as director, or I'm sorry, CFO of Bjorklund mentioned. And uh, uh, this is the stormwater project that I wanted to highlight. It's in the vicinity of 20th Avenue and Union Drive. These are photographs that were provided by some of the neighbors. On the upper photograph, you, the, the white is hail, uh, but regardless of the hail, the, the, the uh, stormwater crests over the curve, cuts across right next to the corner of this home and runs on down to the street that you see in the lower picture and uh, affects quite a few properties in that vicinity. This project's 100% funded by the stormwater management utility, which is an enterprise fund um, and uh, not affected by some of the other economic situations that we're dealing with right now. Next slide, please. Another one of the enterprises is the water system. Lakewood has a small water utility. It's about 750 customers in the far northeast part of town, but we do have a couple of projects that are about to go to construction. Uh, the first is a couple of system loops near 20th Avenue, east of Fenton. And loops simply eliminate dead end water lines. Dead end water lines have a couple of challenges associated with them. One is that you have to be uh, vigilant about maintaining water quality because the, you can end up with uh, stale water at the end of the line. And so we have to flush those lines using uh, fire hydrants, which is a little perplexing to people in an arid area where they see these fire hydrants running water out to the street. But it's a water quality health issue and that's why we do that. This will reduce the need for that. The other thing it will do is uh, provide a second way for water to get into certain areas instead of being at the end of a dead end line where if there's a failure upstream, there's no other way to get water to someone. This provides a loop that can allow water to be served from two different directions. So we have a couple of small projects on, uh, near 20th Avenue for that purpose. The other project is on one of the older water lines that we have in our service area and that's uh, along Colfax Avenue. It is in under Colfax Avenue. 
This segment is between Pierce and Sheridan. And we're doing a fair amount of reconfiguration there instead of just replacing the line in place all the way for that length under Colfax Avenue. We are gonna replace some of it under Colfax and other places we'll be able to provide water from different directions. Uh, that is the line that's had the most uh, susceptibility to breaks in the last few years. So it'd be good to get that one taken care of. Again, this is 100% enterprise funded work. The picture on the lower right is, is a picture of lead service lines, something we've all heard about. And, and as the city council knows, the Denver Water Department has an active program approved by the health department to replace place those lines in all of Denver's service area, including the Lakewood Water Utility Area. As we do these two, two uh, system improvements that I mentioned specifically that are listed on this slide, we'll implement uh, those that, uh, that process of removing these lead service lines of course, we'll need permission of the, the property owners to do that, but generally I think they'll be cooperative and be interested, and those will be replaced at no cost to the individual property owners. Next slide, please. I want to talk just a little bit about future new projects. Uh, this, too, is probably no surprise to the City Council, but the trend in capital projects, again, this is outside of the utilities, the enterprises has been towards capital expenses being used primarily to maintain capital facilities and replace capital facilities. The Capital Improvement Fund has been headed that direction for a number of years. We've talked about that at other budget study sessions in the past. COVID-19 and, and its effect on revenues has accelerated that trend to the, to the point where with these next words that you're about to see, we're able to still do some things. Um, next slide, please including fulfilling our legal obligations and maintain, maintaining and replacing infrastructure to the degree that we have in the past. We are also are gonna be able to finish the approved discrete projects. So if a project's been in a past city council budget in the capital improvement fund or the taper fund, we will be able to complete those, but there won't be many opportunities for additional uh, projects. And you'll see that here in this next slide. Uh, there are some exceptions, however, even though that will be limited, there are some exceptions. The three enterprises, as I mentioned earlier, are funded separately and not particularly affected by the revenues that COVID affects. And the Tabor funds are a separate fund for specific purposes, as, as described earlier by CFO Bjorkland. So those will still have opportunities for new projects, uh, but other opportunities are gonna be fairly limited. So I want to spend the rest of my time in the presentation before I answer a few questions talking about a Tabor Fund new project. So if we go to the next slide, I'll introduce that. And this is a new project that we've not discussed before uh, and is proposed in the, the budget before you. And that's improvements in the area of the Wadsworth and Morrison Road intersection. And I'll take a couple of slides to walk through this. As you know, when the Green Gables development occurred in unincorporated Jefferson County, Wadsworth was modified significantly. It has three northbound lanes and three southbound lanes adjacent to the former country club, and then some left turn lanes as well. This project would extend that three lane section in each direction further south, about 2,000 feet south, measured from the south side of the Green Gables development. That 2,000 feet is all Lakewood, uh, uh, jurisdiction on the east side. I'll show a, a photograph here in a minute that will illustrate that. It will also improve Morrison Road going to the west about 500 feet and it will complete that intersection of Morrison Road and Wadsworth so that that eastern leg which has been planned now for some time could be constructed. The new traffic signal will provide for a fourth leg and while it won't be completely constructed with this, this project it'll be all set up for that purpose. Uh, so how do, how do we fund this? Well, there are a couple of things. Uh, first of all, let me hit that third bullet there. Morrison Road, this is a proposal from the Colorado Department of Transportation, and we've been working on ways to put together this project jointly, which is typical on state highways that the State Department of Transportation and the local jurisdiction would work together to figure out how to get it done. One aspect here is that Morrison Road would become a city street from Kipling Parkway to Wadsworth Boulevard. All of Morrison Road west of Wadsworth today is a state highway, so they have certain maintenance responsibilities, uh, the pavement, snow plowing, 
there are things that the city is responsible for, but not, not much. With, with this change where the city would take over ownership and responsibility for Morrison Road from Wadsworth west to Kipling Parkway, not all the way across the city, but just to Kipling Parkway, that would be part of the agreement uh, that would allow the Colorado Department of Transportation then to put in about four and a half million dollars. Uh, the state also controls the two million dollar federal grant that you see there. And so out of this $10 million project, about 60% or so is, is provided in state and federal funding. Uh, next slide, please. This is a aerial photograph of that area. And on the, the yellow area is the project vicinity. Just north of all the yellow is the Green Gables property. That red dash line north of the yellow that goes on north or up the screen and east or to the right, that's the city boundary. So to the left and below that red line is the city. Northeast of that red line is unincorporated Jefferson County where the Green Gables development occurred. Toward the lower part of the slide, there's also a red line. It's a little bit more difficult to see, but that's Vassar Avenue. Uh, the north side of Vassar Avenue is in Lakewood. The, the south side is not in Lakewood. So you can see this project completes that portion of Wadsworth from, or across the Lakewood frontage from the uh, former Green Gables Country Club site down to Vassar Avenue. That includes one single family house down on the south end, but the remaining property is the former Taylor property. The northern portion is still privately owned, north of Morrison Road roughly. South of Morrison Road, uh, that open space to the east side, to the right side of Wadsworth is all uh, city owned. And then there's the work on Morrison Road going to the left of, of Wadsworth on this illustration as well. So I mentioned earlier, it will create that Eastern leg, which is ultimately the park access when uh, the former Taylor property is developed uh, that the city owns, the new traffic signal will go in, we'll add the lane northbound and southbound on Wadsworth. There's also going to be a new shared use path on that east side. Today, there is no path. Well, that's not true. There's a dirt path uh, that people use walking uh, this full length that's shown in yellow here. This project would create a concrete paved path, a shared use path, primarily separated from Wadsworth by several feet so that there'd be a little bit of a buffer there but from the high speed traffic for pedestrians, bicyclists and others that would be on the path. That is a new project proposed in this budget. And the, the additional funding from the city uh, is some open space money to fund the grant for the path, but also the Tabor portion, the transportation portion of the Tabor funding uh, that's newly available at this time. That concludes my comments about uh, projects Public Works is involved in that will be uh, uh, beginning construction in 2020 or 2021. And I should mention that the Wadsworth Morrison project is a little farther out. There are a number of processes that you're familiar with that have to happen. There will be an IGA, an intergovernmental agreement with the state. There will be some, some design work, some utility relocation, some property acquisitions before the roadway actually gets constructed in a few years. I think there are three questions that have come up from city council members that I'll go ahead and address here before I yield the floor. The first had to do with the neighborhood participation program on page 418. It shows a, an amount of 280,000 for the 2020 revised budget. And then for 2021 through 2015, it shows 180,000 per year. So it's $100,000 less in the later years rather than the 280,000 in the first 2020 revised year. And I, I, was, I greatly appreciated this question because there, there are two ways that can be understood and it's easily misunderstood since we don't see the previous year numbers. The 2020 revised number uh, is the 180,000, which is the normal budget has been for a number of years, but it also has some carry forward in it. There are projects that were previously approved by the city council that are not complete. Uh, to complete those projects, that funding is carried, for, carried forward. So the base program remains at the historic $180,000 a year level. The additional $100,000 shown in 2020 revised budget is that carry forward to ensure the previously approved projects will be completed. The second 
question. I also greatly appreciated it. it was about whether or not skipping a year of street resurfacing costs might be helpful. How much would that be? Can we do that for the long run? And it is a large program. It shows in the Capital Improvement Preservation Program at about $10 million a year. It escalates annually just to deal with construction cost escalation. So it's a large program and it's, it's a, an interesting question. It is capital improvement funded, not general fund improvement, or not general fund funded. Consequently, the reduction or absence of that program for a year would not help the general fund. It would only be money available for the capital improvement fund, fund purposes. We certainly have looked at this question uh, in multiple years. This has been one of those years because of the effects on the capital program, uh, the COVID economic impacts. Deferring maintenance does result in more cost over time, which was also mentioned in the question. And so it's not a good thing to do for a long time. It's not a good thing to do in a large amount. Uh, however, Lakewood streets are in, in generally good to fair condition. So early in this year, as COVID began to have its early effects, I think it was in April, we began looking at whether or not we should scale back that program, at least for a little bit of time, to generate a little bit of breathing room. Uh, in addition, we have to make those decisions fairly early in the year because the program, here we are in September, and the program has been essentially done for more than a month. And so to work with the contractors, we had to make some decisions back in the April, May timeframe. We did scale it back in 2020. Uh, we cut the program by about two and a half million dollars. So that's about a 25% cut in the program for this one year. Uh, after looking at the options, the high uncertainty about the economic situation back in March and April, that was the, the decision that was made. And it's been very helpful. It's allowed some of those things I mentioned earlier to continue, which is to complete the projects that the city council had already authorized. But we don't recommend that we continue that practice, either at the 25% cut level or any other level, frankly. The investment in the roads is very substantial. Uh, roadways, when they when they have a curve of decline that gets steeper and steeper, and so deferring maintenance doesn't get uh, proportionally more expensive, it grows much quicker than that. So I would not recommend that that program be cut uh, fully for a year or substantially uh, for another year. Uh, the third question that I'll respond to was about the effort to find a solution for the the municipal organics recycling needs and the community's recycling needs of organics. This is prim primarily tree limbs, that sort of thing, yard waste. Uh, this is a pro uh, an effort that's been underway for a number of years, as many of you know, and it is an interdepartmental effort. And that was the question, is the sustainability division of the planning department involved in this discussion? They certainly are, uh, as, as is the community resources department, the, the parks and and forestry folks also have a need for this type of facility occasionally. Uh, so all of those departments are, are involved in various degrees in trying to find a solution to this, this challenging question. I think the, it is the last question that I had to respond to tonight. And with that, I will uh, turn the floor over to Director Kit Newland of the Community Resources Department. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hutchison. Good evening, Ms. Newland. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Oh, there I am. Hi, Mayor and Council. Nice to be with you tonight. Thanks for the opportunity to share some information about our projects with you. So tonight I'll be talking about our completed pro projects and projects that are underway, as well as uh, our the Neighborhood Participation Program projects that we are involved in. And then we'll also talk, I'll also touch on the Tabor projects. Next slide, Holly. So just recently finally completed was the Glennon Heights pool renovation. And this was a project that started way back in 2017 with lots of public engagement, which did um, 
which did cause us to revisit the plans because we got a lot of feedback that folks didn't necessarily like what we were planning. So uh, it took a little bit extra time in planning, but we have a beautiful site for people to use hopefully next year. Um, the bathhouse was completely renovated and um, we also did some renovations on the baby pool and that involved um, adding a couple of small splash features and then also a zero depth entry. When the, when the construction crew went in to start working on that pool, we learned that there were some significant leaks in the, the, um, in the uh, circulation system. So that also added some, quite a bit of time to this project to identify where, that, where the problems were coming from. And uh, we were able to replace all the circulation with PV, PVC piping, which has been a great, a great change. So we can't wait to welcome neighbors back there next year. And that project was funded through a combination of open space and general funds. Next slide. And this is a picture of the old shelter at Ray Ross Park. Ray Ross is located at 680 South Harlan Street. This is the old shelter on the left and then the new shelter on the right. This shelter was added with CDBG funding and um, we have experienced nothing but packed shelter, the one on the left, since we opened this park after the renovation. And since that point in time, we knew that we needed to try to accommodate more people in a shelter. So we had the opportunity to get some CDBG funding and this is a great addition to the park. Again, hopefully we'll see lots of people out there enjoying this space next year. And next slide. Last year, we completed three really great additions to Addenbrook Park, and those are, we replaced the playground. You can see the new playground pictured in both of those pictures there. That was an NPP project. Um, we also added a, a 50th art installation to celebrate the 50th of the city of Lakewood, and that was installed in October of last year. Um, that's a really nice area on the southeast side of the park that kind of is sort of a meditative and reflective area. If you haven't visited, you should check it out. It's really quite lovely. And then lastly, we added a fitness court, which is on the southwest side, of, sort of southwest side of the park. Um, also a really great addition. It's been very busy. And um, that was funded with a grant and some open space funds. Next slide. The next project that has recently been completed also took quite some time is Mount Air Park New Lighting. Mount Air is located at 5620 West 14th Avenue. And this is a, a park that, the, that was poorly lit and an area of town where we see some um, undesirable activity. So we, we were able to get funding from um, open space and allocated it last year and we've been able to replace all the lights there and then add um, quite a few lights in some areas that were not well lit before. So we hope that this is gonna help with um, kind of deterring some of that undesirable activity at that park. Next slide. What you're looking at here is um, Idlewild Playground replacement. Idlewild is at 10400 West 14th Place, which is basically between Miller and Lee on 14th. It's a small park and it's due, it was overdue for uh, new um, playground equipment. And this is what we're putting in there. That's being installed as we speak. We're hoping that will be completed um, by next week, by the end of next week. And that project was also funded through CDBG. The next slide shows um, Cottage Park, which is currently in progress. Cottage is located at 110 South Cody Street. This um, was our former Meadowlark Cottages site where we had early uh, childhood education programs for many years. It was a former um, R1 school building, buildings. Um, we got lots of feedback, both through public meetings and Lakewood together and both on the site plan, which you see the concept of right here, and then also on the naming of the park. This was a naming opportunity that we haven't had before, well, for many, many years. And so people were excited to submit ideas for names and they voted and we ended up with the favorite being Cottage Park. Um, that project is being funded through open space. 
and um, it's in site plan review right now. And next slide. This is a drawing of and a um, um, picture of Quail Street Park. This is the little little pocket park that's going to be added at the former YMCA park at basically 20th and Quail. Um, now that property is owned by Denver Water, and we are leasing a small portion of it to put a little park in there and add some um, park and recreation amenities. And we'll also be adding a sidewalk there. So the, that this project is also in the site plan review process right now when we hope to be building it out next year. That project is being funded through open space. And then the Quail Street, I'm sorry, Neighborhood Participation Program. Um, these are the projects that are scheduled from NPP for next year. Uh, we're putting a labyrinth in at Chester Portsmouth. We're adding a playground at Westland Park. And that, that playground was part of, we, we contributed open space funds to the NPP project so we could do a larger uh, renovation at Westland. So it's not just a playground. Um, we're using open space funds to add a pedestrian bridge and uh, quite a few other amenities. You can see in the slide there, uh, sort of an example of what we're hoping the, the park will look like. Um, we're also um, adding a shelter at Harrison Park and eventually getting to doing landscape improvements at the corner, the southwest corner of Colfax and Wadsworth that was submitted by um, the 40 West as an NPP project. And we're um, excited about what we're going to be able to do with a community build there. But that has been put off. It was originally scheduled to be done this year. It had to be put off because of the community build and the COVID issue. And you're looking here at the um, pictures of the Taylor property which Jay just mentioned in one of his previous slides. Um, and he covered very well the access um, issues that um, we are very excited about getting resolved. So we have set aside 600 in open space funds to match uh, the grant, the TAP grant. And, um, and then we'll be using some of our Tabor funds to develop the park. Uh, we're, we've been working closely with Jay and his team and CDOT to devise a plan so that we can as quickly as possible get access for folks out onto that site. The next slide is uh, pictures of what we are hoping for uh, along the Bear Creek Greenbelt Trail. Um, this is really an exciting project for us. We're going to be replacing and realigning um, the concrete um, that is gone, that's gone bad along the trail and then we're also going to be adding a parallel trail um, that will be for joggers and walkers and then the concrete for cyclist people on wheels if you will um, that'll be a crusher fine trail uh, we're also we'll also be replacing two bridges and rebuilding and realigning some of the areas along the trail that have some really um, dangerous and scary curves and so forth Along with the Tabor funding, we are also um, apply, we've applied already for a land and water conservation fund grant in the amount of three quarters of a million, which we hope will, you know, help us to meet the goals of this project. And then uh, in October, or November this year, we'll also be submitting for a um, uh, open space Jefferson County open space funding to help to add some amenities such as some restrooms at the stone house and so forth. So um, this could be a really great project. It's gonna take a while, but because of all the funding and the challenging um, turns and there's a lot of floodplain issues and so forth. But once it's complete, it's gonna be a really, really great addition for the citizens. And it's a regional amenity, as many of you know, others, not just Lakewood residents use this trail, but it's been identified in Jefferson County's trail plan as a priority project for them, knowing how, how much it's used across the region. So we're very excited about that. I also wanted to mention um, that we, we did complete um, a purchase, an acquisition of the Totive property, which is an addition to the, um, <laughs> Oh, yay, which is an addition to Walker Branch Park, which we've been um, 
working on for many, many, many and wanted to do that for many years. And we finally were able to put that deal together. And that really, that makes that park complete, I think. So next year we've set aside some open space funds to do the, the planning um, for a new kind of, what are we gonna do with that new addition and how are we gonna improve the park overall? So we'll be working with Edgewater on that next year. And um, so that's really exciting. I know uh, Councillor Harrison and Councillor Vincent and LeBure, I know you guys are very excited about that and so are we. Um, and then lastly, upcoming projects. I just wanted to mention a few of the things that other things we have on our plate next year. A building infrastructure improvements. We're working on energy improvements. You'll probably hear much more about that from Jonathan when he does the sustainability um, update for you in a couple couple meetings. And then we'll be replacing playgrounds at James Harrison and Morris Park. Um, I just mentioned the Walker Branch planning. We're continuing to work on the caretakers cottage res cottage restoration, which is at Belmar Park, and um, we'll be working on Two Creeks Park development. And lastly, uh, we we have on our plans, uh, on our schedule for next year, to start working on the master plan of Wright Street. So this is a park over in the Union Corridor area that um, has not had a master plan done on it yet. So that is on our plan. And um, I think that's my last slide. So, um, and. I also got um, some questions that I can answer right now tonight and perhaps some others that we'll be able to answer a little bit later. So let me go through those questions. The first one was um, uh, referenced page 476, Cottage Park, no funding earmarked for park features. Um, the answer is that it does show on page 476 um, 310,000 has been identified. We do believe that it's going to be about 350. And it's also identified as a site um, improvement project on page 442. It's listed there. It's funded through open space. Uh, on page 659, um, this was the next question, question number two. The Lakewood Park tennis courts, 800,000 is budgeted for replacement. These courts are operated by a vendor who charges hefty rates. How does this fit with our core community values? These court, these, the answer is, these courts were built in 1973. They'll be 48 years old next year. And it's just a, um, a physical infrastructure improvement that is one of our core community values. And the courts are owned by the city of Lakewood. It's our responsibility to take care of them. And again, I think I did mention that the funding source for those improvements are open is open space. And that's exactly what open space funds are intended to do, help us care for our aging infrastructure and make park improvements. Number three, question number three is, there was an infusion of money for playground equipment from CDBG. Are all of these in CDBG areas? Who are the citizen reps for the CDBG committee? So um, I, I'm just gonna, we're guessing that maybe this question was related to the uh, 350,000 that was allocated from, from CDBG for um, Morris Park Playground. And yes, Morris Park is located in a CDBG eligible area. The second part of the question, um, there are no citizen reps, it's a, it's the committee that goes through the evaluates those projects is a, a staff committee. It, there's staff representation from every department. And then those projects are also put out for feedback, for public feedback for 30 days. And that's all according to uh, HUD guidelines. And then the next, the last question that I have is why is Two Creeks Park, which has open space funds not coming sooner? And the, the reason that this has been, a, you know, the detention pond that's at 12th and Wadsworth has previously CDOT wanted to use it and then they weren't and then they were and then they weren't. Now um, we are in communication with them and we are working on um, how to get that everybody's needs met. So we're working collaboratively with them, which is why we were able to put planning in the budget for next year and park development in the budget. 
And that concludes my questions as well. And at this time, I'll turn it back over to Holly. Thank you, Ms. Newland. Nice job. Ms. Bjorklund. So uh, in terms of the main presentation, this is the conclusion of it. And then um, we will have presentation from Robert Smith. We're looking forward to hearing your feedback on the proposed 2020 revised and 2021 budget. And we are also looking forward to working with you on discussing or our evaluation of the longer term sustainability, sustainability of revenue for Lakewood. Um, so we're open for questions, but that will be after um, we hear from Robert Smith. Great, thank you. Um, and then also I just wanted to remind you of the next steps, which is we will be having another presentation on October 12th for the first public hearing. So now I will turn it over to um, the Director of Economic Development, Robert Smith. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Smith. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction here. I'm, uh, I'm actually here tonight as a representative of the Lakewood Reinvestment Authority. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that uh, budget. It's a separate document. And you may notice that you get the uh, separate documents uh, in, your, in, your, in your packets. There's the, there's the city budget right here. And then there's the LRA budget. They have different covers, they're different documents because the LRA is a, a different unit of government. If you look real closely too, you can kind of see that there's a difference between the two budgets right there. Um, and we'll be talking mostly about this budget this evening. But before I get going too far, I wanted to mention that this budget, the Economic Development Fund that some folks are uh, very uh, familiar with, uh, the uh, lodging tax, the hotel tax, um, that's a, taken care of in this particular budget. So the Economic Development Fund is uh, in these funds over here, Lakewood uh, Reinvestment Authority completely separate in the other, other one here. Obviously we're uh, struggling right now with our hotels and whatnot. Uh, accommodations are a fraction of what they normally would be. So uh, uh, difficult times for the uh, Economic Development Fund. Um, but I'll also mention one other thing, which is a question that came in uh, previously um, from the council members with regard to page 415 of this document along the way, it had to do with uh, a revenue sharing program that's associated with the CIF. Um, and essentially the question was, you know, what revenue sharing agreements do we have in general? And so let me answer that before I get too far into the uh, LRA budget. And the uh, answer to that question is, is that one on 415 um, has to do with two areas that are associated with the Colorado Mills and the Denver West area. Um, the, both of those were put into place right around the uh, year 2000 when, when those projects were annexed into the city. Um, and that's why they have that kind of recurring uh, a basis all the way until two, uh, 2025, because they're 25 year uh, revenue sharing deals. The other uh, ones that I'll mention, it's not a tool that we use very often in Lakewood in terms of revenue sharing, um, but the other two things that I'll mention is, is that we have four urban renewal areas, and I'll mention all of those again when I get to the LRA budget, um, but the Creekside one, the one that's at uh, Wadsworth and Colfax has a uh, sales tax sharing component in it. Uh, essentially, that has to do with uh, reimbursing for the cost of uh, the uh, drainage way areas that are in that particular uh, zone. And then I'll mention that uh, we also have a couple of revenue sharing agreements with vendors out of the community resources department. So for example, the uh, Rocky Mountain paddle boards and ski school um, charges some fees for those things. And then they have uh, uh, revenue sharing back with the city. And so those are the ones that are in general and that's really all the, uh, the ones there. So hopefully that answers that question um, to the satisfaction. So moving on into the LRA budget, uh, again, separate unit of government, so a separate budget altogether. Uh, Holly, if you wouldn't mind switching up the, uh, the slide in there, we're gonna celebrate some of the things that we were able to get done in 2020. I would say overall, this budget is what I would call a workman's budget, uh, meaning that it's, it's taking care of all of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's based on property taxes or more accurately, the, the increment above property taxes from the base kind of complicated, but bottom line is they're based on property taxes and those have not yet been affected by COVID. Perhaps they won't be uh, into the future, but there's not a lot of uh, uh, fluctuation in this budget from the, the previous one. 
You see right there the Alameda Streetscape project. That's something that we've been working on for the last two years. Uh, great rave reviews from the community on this one. A lot of green, a lot of landscaping, uh, sidewalks up both sides of Alameda Avenue. Here you're looking at Alameda from, you can see the Staples building right there in the lower right-hand corner. In the upper corner there is uh, downtown Denver. And you see that median that's in the middle there. That's landscaped. Uh, it really is creating kind of a, a place-making sort of an arrangement there. That median in the middle is uh, new as part of this project. So we were able to add to the transportation or safety of that. Um, you might recall before you were able to trans, you know, you were able to make a left-hand turn against all three of those lanes to go into either the sporting goods place or the or the uh, restaurants over on the other side. Now you go up to the edge, you turn around, do a U-turn, you're in there, a little safer maneuver. And so we're hoping to see great results from that. Uh, next slide, please, Holly. This one here gives you a little bit better shot. We sent the drone uh, uh, footage up there to be able to take a look. You can see that there's a variety of uh, landscaping materials. And as, as I said, uh, uh, great reviews from the uh, from most of our citizenry here. There's also lights. You see that uh, that that pole shaped light that's in the foreground there. And also, I'm, as I mentioned, sidewalks that go up both sides of the street to add to pedestrians. Now you see those pedestrians, they just happen to be there on the day we uh, sent the drone up there. Um, one of the things you might notice with all four of those pedestrians is they're staring at their smartphones as they walk along the uh, street. They can do so safely because it's a detached sidewalk, but hopefully in the future they will be tipping their heads up and checking out all of the great landscaping that we've uh, put into this project. Next slide, please, Holly. And as I, I wanted to mention that this was a great uh, project that came out of the Public Works folks, got to give a big tip of the hat to uh, Vince Castile and uh, Ken Nyhoff um, for supervising this project and making sure it came in on time and uh, under budget. Um, one of the things that we used is to use a lot of the trees that were already in existence. In the background of this particular shot, you can see some mature trees that have been there. Those were left into the project, kept into the project, designed into the project. And then you see in the foreground, a couple of new trees planted. Those eventually will create shade all up, uh, all up and down that uh, pedestrian corridor. So it's gonna be a great amenity for the uh, urban renewal area along Alameda. Next slide. And of course, we get this uh, marker that's at Alameda and Wadsworth, uh, Lake Woods downtown. Um, you'll notice the red uh, stone that's in there because um, essentially this this um, Alameda corridor was uh, designed to be uh, the way in which Denverites would get to the mountain park, so the Red Rocks and and, uh, and uh, those areas up in there. And so what we did was we incorporated some of that Red Rock and that uh, uh, those materials to indicate that uh, along the way. Uh, and we, that's one of the reasons why this gateway element is designed the way it is. Next slide. This is uh, looking towards the west, towards those mountain parks from uh, from the uh, east. And you can see Benton is in the foreground there, moving from left uh, left to right. And again, you see those two great sidewalks with the with the uh, distance in between them, the detached from the from the highway, so you can walk those sidewalks safely along the way. And you can see an incredibly large right of way in there that that right of way was actually, a, a, we, we acquired that back in the 1930s in order to get that done. And we completed this project in, in 2020. So just goes to show you, you really only need about 85, 90 years and you can, you can get the projects done and get them uh, moving along there. So next slide. Um, that's looking the other direction once again there, and you can see kind of how that intersection uh, comes together. There's the discount gas in the in the foreground and the Chase Bank, and then some of the other properties over towards a, a Federal and into Denver. I would challenge any of our uh, folks to to go out to Federal, turn uh, around, and head west on Alameda from Federal, and uh, you will immediately notice when you cross Sheridan, you work your way into into Lakewood, much different feel, much different vibe for the streetscape. Um, that's one of the things that the LRA has invested into this. It's a great program uh, because we combine funds not only from the CIF uh, and not only from the Lakewood Reinvestment Authority, but also some uh, developer funds from the uh, folks over there at Belmar. Next slide. We uh, finished up this project. We got we sent the drone up before it was done, but this is the uh, what we call Phase D. It's uh, sort of that residential area that's right around Pierce and Alameda. All of the uh, the uh, right away that you see over the side, right behind the bus stop, all of that's been completed. Has a great number of trees over there. It's going to be a great shade uh, grove that's over there for those uh, folks walking along and uh, heading in from either from Belmar or to Belmar, right there uh, uh, on uh, on Alameda and Pierce, roughly. Next slide. And then I'll mention one of the other things that we did, this is up in the Colfax uh, Urban Renewal Authority area. Uh, we refinanced the station betterment loans 
uh, that we had on there. So we took out loans in 2008 to improve both of these uh, these uh, stations, the uh, light rail stations at Oak Street and at the Lakewood uh, Wadsworth uh, intersection there. And you can see some of the improvements that were put into there. Those loans uh, obviously had payments that were associated with them every year. Uh, our finance department being the, uh, the top notch, uh, paying attention to detail kinds of folks that they are, uh, determined that we could get a better interest rate so we refinanced those uh, those things for the remaining portion of the loan. Going to save about one hundred twenty five thousand dollars for the uh, folks uh, there that will go back into the uh, urban renewal fund and be able to use for uh, blight mitigation in our urban renewal areas. Next slide. Uh, I'll mention that we have a total of four. I talked about that at the beginning, and uh, if you're looking at that, you say, "Well, gosh, Robert, that looks a lot like three. Well. It's sort of three because two of the areas are in that uh, that lower one in the West Alameda corridor. You can see there's a phase one and a phase two. Phase two is Belmar proper. Phase one is most of the Alameda corridor. And you can see the year that we're going to complete the increment capture is 2025 there. Um, and then the two above, you've got the Colfax Wadsworth, which is what we refer to as Creekside a lot of times. That's the uh, Walmart development there that's on uh, Colfax and uh, and uh, Wadsworth, um, the completed increment capture is happening in 2024, just a few years away. And then the uh, rest of the West Colfax corridor reinvestment area got about 10 years on there. So part of what we wanna accomplish with the LRA in 2021 is to really refine some of our projects, uh, our resource uh, allocations, things that we wanna do for each of these areas moving into the future. So next slide, if you please. These are some of the things that we've got planned to do in 2021. They don't change the budget um, per se, and that's why we still have that workmanlike budget. Um, but we're in the uh, 2021 with the LRA commissioners. Uh, we'll be talking about planning for those existing areas, using those resources um, to figure out what we're going to do in the horizons that we have left on those. Uh, we may do some possible new urban renewal areas uh, along the way. We talked about the fact that this is a pretty good tool, urban renewal, um, for mitigating blight in the city, and there's some other areas that could use that love. Uh, and then uh, that will require the expansion of the URA board. Talked a little bit about this in late 2019. Um, obviously we got uh, a little bit sidetracked with the pandemic and now we're gonna come back on 2021 and figure out all of those. So with that, I have my, uh, what I believe is the concluding slide. We'll find out, it is. And so I will say thank you and express my gratitude for your time and attention. You've been gracious enough to give me 11 minutes and five seconds uh, of tonight's uh, uh, presentation. I very much appreciate it. I will turn it back over to Ms. Bjorkland at this point. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Bjorkland. And that concludes our presentation. We do have a few directors on that can answer additional questions that have been sent in, um, but I'll turn it over to you to decide how you wanna go about answering additional questions. Great, thank you, Ms. Bjorkland. So, um, I'm going to turn it to Ms. Hodson because there were some that came in and I know staff really tried to get as many of them answered tonight. So let's finish out these and then I'd like to, you know, just ask if there's public input. We also have uh, members of the budget and audit committee on the phone as well and they have any. And, and just to reiterate, this is the great opportunity to really push this out in the community. And I know going forward, there's going to be a lot of questions from, from community members and council members. I know Ms. Hodson will just keep those um, and make sure that council gets an answer, you know, to all those at the same time in some way, shape or form. And I think we have a month before the next or the actual first public hearing. So with that, I'll turn to Ms. Hodson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So for a point of reference, we will be posting this particular presentation on Liquid Speaks. So anyone who wants to see it between now and first and second reading, you're welcome to go to the website and get that. Um, at, as I think Holly said, toward the end of the evening, we received additional questions. And I believe Travis Parker, planning director, can answer some of those questions as it relates to um, homelessness outreach and CDBG, et cetera. So Travis has indicated that he's visited with staff um, and is uh, able to answer those questions. So Travis, can we let Travis on the board? And after that, um, we're gonna have Scott Hefty come also on the screen because there were a few questions about the courts and Scott is prepared to answer those. So Travis, if you would please read the question 
and then provide the answer to the couple of questions that refer to your particular area. Thank you. Absolutely. Good evening. That's awesome. Good uh, evening, Mr. Parker. Good evening. Uh, there are two questions uh, related to CDBG and homeless outreach. The first question was, uh, why is CDBG uh, program funding so much less than last year? Uh, why is the cut all coming out of homeless activities? Uh, the answer is uh, there is actually not a cut in federal CDBG funding from the previous year. Uh, the 2020 revised sh totals show the actual amounts allocated and approved. The 2021 budget totals are estimates based on ongoing programs. So the, the amount that appears in our actual numbers fluctuates a lot every year based on how much actually gets spent in programs and it's higher some years and lower some years. Um, the 2021 budget amounts will increase once uh, 2021 CDB, CDBG application is released in October and reviewed in November. Um, at this time, we don't know the projects or funding levels for the 2021 CD, CD, CDBG program, uh, which begins on June 1st of next year and ends on May 31st, 2022. Um, in terms of the homeless activities, uh, the 130,000 for that uh, in 2020R includes both the 2019 CDBG money that was not spent because the navigator wasn't hired until March of 2020. Um, and the 2021 budget amount of 50,000 is an amount that we anticipate allocating and is in alignment with HUD regulations, which is the limit of the amount that we can spend for direct services. Um, the other question that I can answer, which is, um, what do we do with the homeless outreach grant? And the answer there is this grant is through the police department's CAT team. Um, that grant was a one-time grant from the Colorado Health Foundation, and it was used to pay for the two homeless navigators, both salary and benefits, and some equipment. Um, so it's currently funding those two positions. Um, and I'm certainly available if there are follow-up questions later. Great, thank you. Mayor, can I add one more thing? We got noticed today, brand new, hot off the press, that we will be awarded an additional $738,000 from CDBG to be used for COVID purposes. So that's that's on top of the 370,000 that we already received. Um, that, that'll come in front of you for an appropriation um, action, but this is funding from HUD and you may wonder how you're gonna spend that money so quick and HUD has a different time frame, and we're, um, it looks like about a three-year window to spend these additional dollars. Of course, they have to be used only for COVID um, purposes, but that's another three quarters of a million. So I think that's great news, and you'll be seeing that come in front of you in due time. So thank you. Thank you, Travis. And now, um, Scott Hefty, our courts administrator, if you would please read the questions that we received about the courts and first read the question and then provide an answer. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Hefty. Mr. Hefty, you are on mute, just FYI. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. The uh, question I received actually is two parts. Uh, number one, the first part of it is, does funding for Teen Court, Lakewood Early Action Program, Girl Circle, Youth Enrichment Support, Youth Education Team all come from the general fund or are these funded elsewhere? So these, these are funded uh, traditionally through the general fund, but it's very minor funding. The majority of the funds are come from uh, personnel costs. So for example, on the teen court, we have a probation officer who stays from six to eight o'clock twice a month. And what we do is uh, we re uh, comp time that person and they get uh, two hours off that the following week. Um, same thing for the early action program. Uh, it's a normal court docket that we run once a month in, in, uh, in division A with Judge Stavick. Uh, and then we have a probation officer working for that. The funds that do come from those these programs, uh, like for, for teen court, we have volunteers from Lakewood High School. Uh, students participate as lawyers, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys. Uh, we throw a party at the end of the year with pizza. 
and cake. So it's those types of funds for supplies and those things. Uh, if you're looking at the, the, so the reduction in that, that's under services and supplies. So we essentially did a lot of reduction of supplies in for the uh, uh, probation department and the courts and, and the court department. Uh, number two, in reference to um, the classes, uh, are the classes uh, and counseling that juveniles and adults get referred to funded by the city or are these state or county programs? Uh, majority of the programs that we that we refer juveniles and youth to are, are nonprofits in the community. So there's like, for example, the Jefferson Center uh, will refer juveniles for the road program or for juvenile mental health counseling. For adults, they go through substance abuse counseling, anger management, uh, relationship counseling, those types of things. Those are done on a sliding scale for that. So those nothing comes out of the city for those those services. Those are all re, those are all referrals uh, for defendants who are convicted or found uh, adjudicated for domestic violence. They do go to uh, state approved programs through the DVOMB, which is the Domestic Violence Offender Management Board. They approve therapists throughout the state of Colorado to provide this uh, therapy. Uh, that is self-paid. Uh, on some instances, if they're veterans or uh, other types of low-income indigent folks. Um, they have reduced sliding fees. Uh, also, the veterans um, uh, program, we have a, a 501c3 through court support, Jeffco, that assists veterans in paying for domestic violence classes as well. Um, that's all the information I have on those two, those two questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hefty. Yes, sir. Ms. Uh, Mayor, now general questions. We don't have any specific questions. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, with that, I will now open the public input portion. And again, this is um, not general public comment, public input on study sessions is geared towards the presentation that we all um, have participated in for the last two hours and really well done, very thorough. And I also wanna thank council for getting those questions in. So with that, I will uh, open the uh, public input portion, it'll be three minutes and you'll press star nine to request to speak and star six to unmute. And Ms. Salazar, do we have anybody in the line outside of our budget and audit members? And then I can turn, turn it over to there. No, we do not. Okay. Okay, so with that, and, and again, um, I will now open it up to council and budget and audit. And this is kind of the first blush. So if we have questions, that's great. If any comments or if uh, you think of things in the next few weeks, we can do all of that as we move forward. So on the line, we have Mr. Scott, Mr. Wickman and Mr. Ludwigson. Are there any questions or comments uh, that you have based upon this presentation? And if you do, just go ahead and press star nine and then star six to unmute. Okay. Well, if you think of something or want to jump in, just let me know and we can come back. And I'll now turn it over to city council. Let me get to that screen. Let's see, I do not have any hands raised at this time. Uh, Ms. Gutwein. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to everyone um, for this budget presentation and then just also uh, operating under the challenging times that we're in and maintaining all of our core services and all of that. I also, I, I was one of the people or maybe the only person who sent in questions late. So um, I want to thank everyone for already having many of the answers to those, those questions um, that I had. I, I do have one additional question. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, in the uh, city manager um, introduction or overview, there was a uh, mention of a potential additional CARES funding through the county. And I just wanted to, to ask about that, if we had any information, if we were 
if we are expecting to see additional funding. Um, so that's my question. Thank you, Councillor Goodwine. Uh, Mayor, if you'll allow me, I'd like to ask Holly to respond to that. She's really been the keeper of all things care dollars. Well, there she is. So can you answer that, Holly? Yes, we actually found out today that we're getting the second half of that funding. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for that update. Sure. So right. I'm sure we'll all have ideas and questions about if we'll how to how to spend it. <laughs> um, but that'll be a question for another day. Actually, it's already been earmarked. Yeah. Oh, um, has it? All of it? Yep. So when we originally asked um, the council to see if we uh, could spend the dollars, we identified the full amount that we'd be able to receive. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you. It's a 12.4. All right. Uh, Mr. Bita and also chair of our budget audit committee, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I just want to say thank you to our, uh, our finance department and all of our department heads who participated in, in all of the staff for, that participated in putting this uh, budget together. It was uh, very. I know it was very challenging, um, given given our situation, you know. And um, I think you did a great job. And I just want to thank you for for all the thought and hard work. Um, you know, seventeen million is no, no nothing to sneeze at when you have to make that up. And um, uh, I think again, and I've said this before, but I think part of that was just because we went into the. Uh, pandemic uh, situation in very good shape to start with the city with our reserves and with having uh, done hiring freezes and other other uh, things that really put us in very good financial shape to start with. So when we came into this, we were in a position that a lot a lot of other cities would really envy. I can tell you that. So uh, um, and then we we made some changes where we needed to. Uh, I appreciate especially the hard work that was done with our uh, public safety, our police department uh, to maintain the level of um, number of our agents on the street and our certified agents and uh, on patrol and so forth so that we, our folks don't experience a, a loss in services on that end. There's, uh, you know, we've basically fully, fully, continue to fund our police department even under these trying times and i i appreciate that and i know our citizens do too so thank you all very much for your hard work and that's all i have thank you sir uh miss harrison thank you um i also wanted to say thank you very much to, to the staff it's it's when we look at these budget presentations and look at the size of book that we've all been, been um, going through here, we really see what's going on in the whole city. And we can see the quality of the folks that we have and the quality of work that's being done and all the hopes and dreams of the future of the city are sitting right here in this book. I want to say thank you so very much to all the people that put it together and really come together and do all this good stuff because I think this is fantastic. It really shows us what the city of Lakewood's really like. I'm sorry that we have to cut this much out of the budget because that's that much more good things that could be happening. But I think we've done it in so far in the 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 most painless way of doing it in a way that we can do it. Um, and I just have to say hats off to everybody. I think you've done such a great job. Um, one thing, one idea that I would really challenge all of council for is if we can come up with a really good way of describing how the ratchet effect affects Tabor and the budgeting process. I think that is very hard for the general public to understand. And if we can come up with a drawing, uh, a paragraph or a whatever, I think we all need to really put our heads together and come up with a way of doing that because that's gonna be a hard thing to explain on down the road. So thank you very much staff. And that's my challenge to council. Thank you. Ms. Harrison, and thank you for that. And I know the budget and audit committee has discussed that 
And uh, I think that's something that could be on their radar as we move forward. And I would just echo everything that has been said and just say, you know, as we look into next year's retreat, I think for me, one of the, my, my main things will be our financial future, certainly. And, and what does that look like with everything changing as well as our urban renewal areas starting to, you know, come off. And, and so how do these things all play in the future? So I'll save that for down the road, but certainly for tonight, a lot of information, a lot of work and one of the smoothest ones I think we've had. And I, I want to credit council for really trying to get your questions in early and, and allow for those to be answered, you know, during the presentation. So I don't see any other hands up and unless people are watching the Bronco game and not the screen, I don't, I think that we might be done with this portion of the budget. And just to reiterate, Ms. Bjorkland, can you restate the dates as to the next two public hearings? Yes, the next one is, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, the next one is October 12th, and that's the first public hearing, and the second one is October 26th. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Mr. Skilling, you had your hand up, but I think maybe you were jumping in with the dates. No, I'm good. Thank okay. You. All right. Well, great. Well, again, thank you to uh, to everybody who's on tonight and to Ms. Hodson and her team. And we'll just go right into reports. And I'll start with Ward 1 and go up to Ward 5. So Ward 1, um, Mr. Abel or Ms. Johnson, please. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to remind everyone that the uh, school is open uh, for many kids in uh, Lakewood, and be careful when you're driving near and around schools and on the paths to schools. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Johnson, anything to add? Yes, I would like to just uh, say that last week I hosted a marijuana summit and it was an unbelievable success. Uh, we will be putting it up on YouTube. We had six people that uh, gave profound information regarding the impacts of marijuana, all the way from DEA and Haida, uh, a district attorney, a lady who is the director of the drug and alcohol screening program, and works with businesses regarding drug-free places. Um, I was just really uh, very humbled by the information and the time that they gave. Uh, and I just want you all to know that that will be accessible for you uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Ward two, Ms. Vincent, Mr. LeBeer. Sure, uh, yeah. Just real quick, um, wanted to apologize to some of the people in Ward 2. Uh, we recorded our ward meeting, and we're hoping to share it with everyone. Of course, we had some technical difficulties with a bad microphone, so we're going to have to try that again. And uh, though I, I think this budget conversation is a, a really good one, uh, perhaps that's what we can uh, make the topic on. Uh, off a lot of good information in this meeting. So a uh, lot to talk about with the neighbors. Um, and, oh, and if anybody wants to know the Bronco score, I'm happy to share that with you. No. Just give me a yeah. thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Thanks. It's a way to get mutiny on the bounty. Yeah. Ms. Vincent. I'm good. Okay. Uh, Ward three, Ms. Springsteen, Mr. Bita. Um, no report here. I'll yield to my co-counselor. Springsteen. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I wanted to report that I was contacted by the producers at 60 minutes about three weeks ago on the issue of ketamine and excessive use of force and was interviewed by them at length twice over the past two weeks. Uh, they're doing a story on the use of ketamine on citizens in Colorado, specifically the Elijah McLean death. I gave them a great deal of my research. Um, it was a very great honor, regardless 
of the direction that they choose to take with their their news piece um, to likely be the the first Lakewood City Councilor ever to be contacted and interviewed by 60 Minutes. I don't know that for sure, but I'm guessing. Uh, this speaks to the importance of the issue regarding the use of ketamine and denial of civil rights and medical rights in Colorado. I'm organizing a task force of medical, legal activists, journalists, so forth, to stop the use of chemical restraint in Colorado and pursue legislation on the issue, maybe hold a ketamine summit. Um, and to that end, I am meeting with Representative Leslie Herod and the Grassroots Law Project this week on the issue. Uh, this very night, uh, Aurora City Council is considering a moratorium on the use of ketamine. Mike Kaufman, the mayor in Aurora, uh, called for paramedics to quit using ketamine uh, a few days ago. Uh, and I got to say that the silence in Lakewood is deafening. I am trying to change the world here and uh, make it a better place and uh, could really use some support from my council and mayor and city leadership. Thanks. All right, Ward 4. Mr. Skilling, Ms. Franks, nothing. Okay, Ward 5, Ms. Gutwein, Ms. Harrison. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, I just wanted to let you all know, uh, one of our residents who you all know well, um, James Mace, has reached out um, to me to talk about uh, suicide prevention and um, just what, what role we can play as a city um, in this conversation. And uh, it's, it's a very important topic to him. And I know to, you know, I'm sure that many of us or all of us have been touched by um, mental health issues in our family or our friends. Um, and so I will potentially um, be submitting a request um, for just a study session or update about mental health issues. I know that will probably be in 2021 before we're really able to address that. Um, and so in the meantime, uh, Councillor Harrison and I are um, gonna try to schedule just a ward meeting or a special, not a ward meeting, a special Zoom meeting about mental health. Um, and we would welcome you know, residents from all areas um, to join us. In, in that, and we'll, we'll share information as soon as we have it. Um, but I wanted to let you know that we, um, that is something that we are working on. Um, we will also, actually, uh, Karen, I may let you talk about our next ward meeting. Um, and thank you for setting up our speakers on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate that. Um, our next ward meeting will be a discussion on the marijuana initiative. Um, and we've got two speakers, a pro and a con, uh, that will be there and would be, would love to have, uh, any of anybody that wants to attend, we'd love to have you there. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It will be a zoom meeting. So it's kind of open to whomever wants to connect and sit and listen. So that's how we're going to do it. Thanks, Dana. That's all. All right, cool. Thank you all. All right, a couple of quick updates. So I wanted to just mention, and um, certainly in the virtual world, it's a lot different, but we have a lot of committees at our meeting. And so an idea was brought forth by one of the council members. And we talked about trying to do committee updates, you know, uh, once a month or, you know, as needed. And so potentially putting out a little form that just is easy for either the chair of that committee or members to put together that talks about who's on the committee, who was there, what you did, and just be able to help the community understand because you're all on multiple committees doing a lot of different things as well as Dr. Cog, 
transportation, all kinds of other things. So uh, we'd like to, I'd like to try to pilot that. And I know we were going to try to do that as a goal this year to have more updates from our committees during our meetings, but haven't had the chance. So I want to just throw that out there to uh, you all and to the community. Also wanted to mention that Alameda Connects is going to do a bike ride on September 19th, the 26th and October 3rd. Sounds like they're meeting at um, the Village Roaster at 9 a.m. And so that sounds like a pretty cool community event. And then this I did send to uh, the communications folks um, in, in regards to COVID and the information that we put out about COVID. But uh, from Hunger Free Colorado, one in three kids are going hungry. And there's a deadline on September 23rd to uh, access $55 million worth of unclaimed benefits for um, EBT cards for pandemic EBT. And so that could really be meaningful to a lot of kids in our community. And so we'll try to make sure that that is out there for the community. If anybody's watching or counsel, you want more of this, I'm happy to forward this email. Um, it looks like in Jefferson County, uh, there's 32% are participating and uh, there's a gap of about 17,000 kids who are not participating in this. So uh, we have until next week, midweek to get that done and to get people signed up. So with that, lastly, I would like to just give a congratulations to Ms. Hodson, who's celebrating her 11th year as our incredible city manager and just want to thank her. And I'm sure time flies in your role of 11 years. But uh, hats off to you. That, that's quite a tenure. And so thank you. And I'd also like to thank our Lakewood Police Department for all they do. So enjoy your evening and we'll see everybody next Monday. Thank you.